Yes. First off, I want to thank the Korean Political Science Association, North Korea Review, and Yonsei Institute of Korean Studies for this opportunity. As I said, my name is Matthew Fleming, and today I'm going to talk to you about denuclearization with the DPRK. Now, while it's a topic I'm sure many of you have talked about to quite an extent, when I think about a contemporary perspective, I think about not only how an issue has evolved, but also how the international system that it takes place in is evolving. And so today I want to talk about the denuclearization of the DPRK post Russia's invasion into Ukraine, and specifically talk about security assurances and nuclear deterrence. So it's gonna follow a five part structure similar to the five chapter structure of the paper, starting off with the purpose statement, a historical and literature review, uh, going into comparing the similarities and security assurances of, given to Ukraine and compared to those offered to the DPRK, and then going into the more argumentative statement and the impact on the perception of value of assurances and negotiations, and then end with some possible developments we could see take place. So, like I said, the purpose of this paper is to elevate the discussion on negotiations with the DPRK around denuclearization by highlighting a comparative approach to the pledges and assurances given to Ukraine that were broken by their invasion, to the assurances presented and offered to the DPRK during denuclearization negotiations to return to the NPT. Starting off with the NPT, as it is the most significant and ratified arms limitation disarmament agreement with the objective to prevent the spread of uh, nuclear weapons and nuclear technology, promote nuclear, uh, peaceful nuclear energy, and further the goal of nuclear disarmament, it is impo it's impossible to talk about denuclearization negotiations without understanding the history a country has with the NPT specifically. Not only is it impactful in what it presents and its wide acceptance, but it presents this centralized movement for denuclearization negotiations to focus on ascension through the NPT as a non-nuclear state. And so we would focus on each country's history with the NPT specifically to look at the negotiations moving forward. Now, Ukraine's history is a little bit different than most countries as it was part of the Soviet Union originally during the treaty's initial formulation. And it wasn't until 1991 when they gained their sovereignty, discussions started having with them about their independence and their role as a nuclear power. Now, when the Soviet Union dissolved, they inherited 15% of the Soviet Union's nuclear arsenal. And while there's academic debate about the maintenance, the possibilities, and the infrastructure's ability to work, it has been altered that the power for non-proliferation was that they had this containment, and so it needed to be addressed. So we did not want it to go into other countries' hands, such as we have seen recently. So with various factors in play, they did decide to denuclearize through the NPT in 1994. And they did so through the NPT's ascension and agreements through the trilateral statement and Budapest moratorium. Now, the DPRK's history is also a similar in the sense that it is a divergent case. Now, while we know that they ascended to the treaty in 1985, in 1993, they did announce that they wanted to withdraw from the treaty, and cited by the, the International Atomic Energy Agency revealing that their activities were more extensive than declared. Now, despite the U.S.'s efforts through the U.S. North Korean agreement frameworks, they would end up leaving the uh, they did end up leaving the treaty in 2003. And why we were able to get them to recommit to denuclearization in 2005 as part of the six party talks, we do know that they have re they have recontinued their nuclear production, doing different nuclear tests and continuing missile launches. So since then, the international community has continued to try to bring the, in, the DPRK back to the denuclearization movement through ascension to the NPT. However, little progress has been made. And so while the NPT is a critical part to know and should be a one of focus, it shouldn't be treated as fully encompassing to denuclearization negotiations. When that aspect, if you subscribe to a neo-realist interpretation of a world based in an anarchical system and focus on great power competition and security maximization, we know nuclear deterrence is a leading, if not the leading, security measure a country can hold. And so when we look at denuclearization negotiations, we need to also look at the security concept and aspect. And the NPT only holds certain assurances focused on nuclear states not using or threatening nuclear weapons against non-nuclear weapon states. And so 
these assurances do not account for the more conventional weapons or conventional aggressions outside of these means, justifying the need for many countries to want to pursue more other agreements additionally to this agreement, justifying the need for us to observe these negotiations in conjunction to their accompanying agreements. So the role of the accompanying agreements and the ones that we did highlight a minute ago through the brief history that we overthrew was this idea of security assurances. Now while assurances are quite common in bilateral and multilateral systems, in the scope of security, academia has broken them down into two different forms, those of a negative assurance and those of a positive assurance. Now a negative assurance is a, a commitment, an assurance or an agreement by one party to another that they will take something off the table, that they will, re they will remain from using certain means or attacking. That's why it's negative, because it's taking an option off. Now, compared to that is a positive assurance, which is putting something on the table, and usually means that they will commit to doing something in an outline situation, such as defending or retaliation. Now, negative assurances, the ones that we mentioned previously about refraining from acting, is colloquially what is referred to as a security assurance, while the positive assurance is really called a security guarantee. Now, the security guarantee is considered more legally binding and more of a commitment to security than that of a politically perceived uh, espousing of a commitment with negative assurances. So when we look back at the situation that Ukraine found itself back after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, keeping the nuclear weapons would have put them in isolation and sanctions from the International Committee, while accepting the NPT and denuclearizing would have helped them be international recognized and joined in the international economy. However, it did not account for the security situation that it existed in, thus implemented the additional security assurances of the Budapest Moratorium in 1994. Through this assurance, it addressed the security aspect in addition to the NPT's economic benefit and political recognition. Inside of this agreement was a negative assurance to reaffirm and commit their um, sovereignty and borders, and party to this agreement was the United States and Russia. Comparing that to negotiations with the DPRK throughout history, the DPRK has existed in a similar situation, one where it is finding itself concerned with security and its legitimacy and the sovereignty and borders of its nation. And so with the growing, specifically with the United States, with the United States growing interest in South Korea, their involvement in the Korean War, the, one of the biggest commitments and issues that the DPRK is concerned about with denuclearization is the security topic. And so during the U.S.-North Korea Green Framework, the U.S. made commitments saying that it has no intention to debate in the DPRK in addition to its formal normalization of political economic relations. Additionally, during the six-party talks, the U.S. reaffirmed more security assurances of a negative nature about how they had no intentions of nuclear or conventional weapons to evade or attack the DPRK. As such, this is highlighting the importance of a security uh, assurance in addition to any negotiations to ascension to the NPT. And so with all that historical out of the way, that brings us to the question is, how do we address the security aspects after the invading of Ukraine by Russia? leading to the argument of, in a post-Russia invasion of Ukraine, the use of accompanying negative security assurances to persuade countries into denuclearizing through the NPT has drastically decreased in negotiation validity, while increasing the positive perception of the necessity for nuclear weapon deterrence. Therefore, the approaches to denuclearize negotiations with the DPRK are forced to evolve to meet these diminishments and perceived value of negotiations of negative security assurances as well as the perspectives and a desire and growth in their own nuclear deterrence. Breaking that up into the two main parts is the vindication and the belief in nuclear deterrent. Breaking the Budapest moratorium security assurances that were offered to Ukraine only can vindicate the DPR in its stance that it needs nuclear weapons as a cornerstone of its practical security framework. By doing so, the perspective not only as a defensive stance, but that as an offensive stance I like the quote by Dr. Sagan when he states that nuclear weapons are not just a force used to deter another state, but can be used as a shield behind one engages in aggression. Now, while these are theoretical ideas that we have known for a long time and main components of security, uh, nuclear deterrence, what is relevantly new and important to look into is the fact that the DPRK now possesses a relevant case to point to and argue with in negotiations. 
while we already knew about security deterrence and we already knew about these different ways that nuclear deterrence can be utilized, negotiations cannot move forward without the expectation for these to be brought up. The second part is the diminishment of security assurances and their value of the NPT. With security being critically linked to nuclear deterrence and deterrence topics, its perceived usefulness as a method to address the security topic, it cannot deny its aggressive its ability in negotiation validity. So if one loses its ability as an assurance, then it also loses ability in negotiations. And this is already something that is being alluded to by scholars and also being alluded to by government officials when we talk about how the status quo in Europe for wars and the status quo for negotiations is beginning to change. Additionally, when we hear former government officials talking about how Ukraine, we gave away our capabilities for nothing, asserts equals security assurances to nothingness by the country that denuclearized. This is direct examples that are happening currently, and it cannot be perceived that we can continue to revert to the old system of just simple negative security assurances. And so that leads to just the many developments that we can see transpire. And for today, I highlighted two main ones, starting off with the further development and reluctance to denuclearize in general. We've already seen this taking place this last week with the UN administration's presentation to the DPRK for his plan of denuclearizing and their quick rebuttal of not enthusiasm. And so when we're starting to see these ideas that the DPRK has already existed for multiple years under heavy sanctions of economic uh, systems and being non-legitimate and excluded from the international world. And so further solidified in their stance that they need nuclear deterrence for a cornerstone is going to be increasingly difficult to entice them to come back to communicate over negotiations in general. However, if they do not stall out, then a possible development we could see is the need or negotiations over stronger legally binding assurances in general. This could take place in the form of positive security guarantees. In the history of United States negotiations with the DPRK, they have multiple times given them negative security assurances, saying that they will not attack and giving them these assurances. However, in 2018, we started to see these stronger, more legally binding commitments starting to appear in negotiations, such as Donald Trump's statement with Trump at the Singapore summit about providing security guarantees, as well as the North Korean foreign minister speaking on how security guarantee is the most important to us in the process of taking this measure. And so with this movement already taking place before the invasion, it's, it makes little sense to know that we cannot go back and refer just simply to negative assurances and expect it to go well in negotiations. We can only possibly see the further development for more legally binding negotiations. And so I want to end today with more of a concluding statement. And for the purpose of time, I'll read the first and last part. And that is in a post-Russia invasion of Ukraine, negotiations that rely too heavily on utilizing negative security assurances of the forefront method to address the security concern cannot continue, will continue to struggle in effectiveness. While it is still arguable that the development of stalling out of negotiations or increased need for substantial legal commitments would transpire, it is clear that the denuclearization negotiations are critically impacted and hindered in a post-Russia invasion, forcing the international community to address their effects. So thank you for today. Thank you.